1997, Joan Jacobs Bromberg, a professor at Cornell University, published a book entitled The Body Project. Its aim was to chronicle the ways in which growing up female are vastly different today than they were a century ago. The crux of her argument is that girls are physically maturing much earlier in modern times. Meanwhile, the social supports for girls' growth and development are, in her words, collapsing. She begins by mentioning that body insecurity is not necessarily a new issue. Plaguing women from all walks of life, many women throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries intimated dissatisfaction with their bodies. Queen Victoria and Anne Frank alike were certain of their physical flaws. The body has been the nemesis of Western women for many decades, Brumberg argues. In the opening chapter of her book, Brumberg assesses that girls seem to menstruate far earlier in the late 20th century than they did one or two centuries ago. She cites Susanna Adams, granddaughter of John and Abigail Adams, as one who got her period at the age of 11 exceptionally early for the time. Data confirms that the average age of menarche has dropped nearly three years since 1820 for American girls. This would not be problematic except that social changes in American culture have also removed some key stabilizing factors for girls as they enter puberty earlier and earlier. Brumberg argues that there has been a significant breakdown in communication between generations. Young girls are no longer relying on their mothers as a source of information about their own biology and are going into the world unarmed with important facts that could help protect them from unwanted pregnancies as well as STIs. Society during Victorian times imposed many restraints on young women once they reached the age of menstruation, but those restraints, whether oppressive or not, did provide supports and supervision for girls as they transitioned into adulthood. Brumberg closes the chapter by indicating that we need to acknowledge our ancestors' pervasive, if largely unspoken, concern about the bodies of adolescent girls was an impetus for a powerful network of social support. This was a functional hallmark of American life well into the 20th century. Sanitizing Puberty, the American Way to Menstruate Hygiene, not sexuality, is the focus of the conversation between mothers and daughters once young girls reach their first period, Brumberg argues. By the 1990s, the sanitary products industry was a more than $2 billion a year business, and it is a sales model built on prolonging a woman's menstrual experience by lowering the age of first menarche and delaying the onset of menopause. The next logical step in the sanitation of menstruation was its medicalization. Suddenly, in the middle of the 20th century, getting your first period was not simply a natural occurrence, but a medical nuisance. The good news, according to doctors, was that the problem could be fairly easily managed with advice from pediatricians and gynecologists. Doctors, and eventually mothers, announced a litany of things to be avoided during the menstrual period. Heavy exercise, hot or cold baths, bathing, and wet feet. In the early 1900s, access to expensive sanitary napkins became a status symbol. Wives and daughters of immigrants could not afford the luxury of sanitary products, and so continued to use the methods they had always used. However, their desire to assimilate eventually meant that the young women grew disdainful of the menstrual practices of their mothers and grandmothers, thinking them unclean. As it became the medical community's mission to sanitize, both literally and figuratively, the discussion on menstruation, sanitary products were advertised in magazines and brochures. Drugstore displays made these products familiar and even accessible to young girls. In the end, throughout the course of the 20th century, girls were being taught and shown how to keep clean during their menstrual periods and avoid offensive smells or stains. However, there has been a significant lack of conversation about what menstruation means for female sexuality and the responsibility it implies. Perfect skin. While maternal influence over menstruation declined in the 20th century, paternal intervention in cases of acne increased. According to Brumberg, 
American parents cooperated with a body project like skin care because they knew that good looks were an important vehicle of social success for their daughters. Interestingly, in the Victorian era, physicians thought that acne was caused by unexpressed sexual desire or a buildup of sexual urges. Thus, they came to believe that marriage was the only way to cure acne. In the early 19th century, mirrors were known as looking glasses and were considered a luxury of the rich. However, at the end of the 19th century, mirrors became a staple of the American middle class, and girls began to pay much more attention to how they looked to others. This also helped to usher in the age of cosmetics. Women and girls were buying many different kinds of skin makeup by the mid-1920s. It is worth noting that minority women paid particularly close attention to their complexions because they were more scrutinized as it was. Their social acceptance was tenuous and precarious, and their faces were monitored with a critical eye. This struggle was particularly poignant among young Jewish women in the early 20th century. A different struggle faced by minority women was the idea that lighter skin was better. This was an age-old idea and certainly not one which originated in the 19th century. However, Americans' new fixation with complexion led many African-American women to try bleaching their skin in order to pass as white or at least become whiter. It was not until the Black Pride movement of the 1960s and 70s that darker skin was considered beautiful. Body Projects as American women gained more liberation of their own bodies throughout the 20th century, they also became slaves to societal standards of beauty. As Brungberg points out, these standards involve spending money, as well as an intense self-discipline in what one consumed and the ways in which one exercised. One of the main body projects young women embarked upon was the desire to be thin and svelte. One case study Brumberg uses is that of Yvonne Blue, a girl who came of age in Chicago during the 1920s. Yvonne, who weighed a healthy 150 pounds on her 15th birthday, vowed to lose 30 pounds by the time she returned to school in the fall. By denying herself of all carbohydrates and most meat, she weighed 125 pounds when she returned to school in 1926. Breasts presented another problem for American women. Mass-produced bras caused great concern in young girls whose mothers formerly made all of their clothing to fit perfectly. Now expected to fit instantaneously into a standard size that represented some norm, girls worried that if a bra did not fit correctly, that the problem was with their bodies and not with the style. Girls began to wish for breasts that were the shape and style of the recent Hollywood trends, regardless of the fact that they could not change their own breast size or shape. Finally, a significant body trend during the 20th century was the desire to individualize one's own identity. Women pursued this individuality through consumerism, shopping, and body art, which included piercings and tattoos. Both piercings and tattoos are becoming much more normalized in the 21st century. The Disappearance of Virginity In the 19th century, virginity was both a biological and a moral state, according to Brumberg. Historically, the word hymen meant both marriage and membrane, which Brumberg points out expresses how closely the two were intertwined. However, with the dawning of sexual liberation in the 1920s, Virginity became less of a moral state and more of a social status. Yvonne, the Chicago teenager mentioned earlier, questioned her own virginity after a series of encounters with her boyfriend. Some women even asked their gynecologist for help removing the hymen membrane before marriage so that sexual intercourse could become more pleasurable for them. Reverence for the hymen continued to dissipate further into the 1930s and 40s, as young women began to use mass-produced tampons, which are internal sanitary products. It was initially considered a threat to virginity, but soon became commonplace as marketing firms successfully appealed to their target demographics. 
Finally, a trend Brumberg spends many pages on is the statistically significant decrease in adolescent virginity throughout the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Parental and medical neutrality toward matters of female sexuality aided and abetted this trend. Girls were treated as adults by gynecologists starting at around age 16. Unfortunately, in this new environment, girls had to handle an increase in sexual pressure, often at younger and younger ages. Young boys took their cues from popular movies and culture and rated young women on a scale of 1 to 10. Girls placed increasing importance on the ratings of young men, and the male gaze was considered to be of great significance. In 1997, Brumberg wrote that Teenage magazines today are filled mm -hmm. with stories of sexual violation and harassment, as well as inquiries about how to fend off unwelcome comments, touching, or outright physical intimidation. Brungberg also suggests that in American culture, girls are eroticized at a frighteningly young age. She concludes the chapter by stating that, in the 90s, the rule book on sexual behavior is slim, and it is summarized quite easily. All sex, no matter what it is, should be mutual, consensual, and protected. Girl Advocacy Again In her final chapter, Brungberg notes how complicated it has become to live in a girl's body today. Girls receive conflicting messages about how liberated they are, and yet how imperfect their bodies are. Their bodies have become their projects, to be worked on until perfection is achieved. She concludes that culture has been failing girls for many decades. The role of parents should be to guide and instruct girls in personal hygiene as well as sexual ethics. Brungberg states that more than any other group, girls have borne the brunt of 20th century social change and that Americans ignore that fact at their peril. Elizabeth Cady Stanton announced her dream that girls would regard themselves not as adjectives but as nouns. In order for this dream to become realized, we need to emphasize that there are bigger projects than one's body. We need to create a culture of body acceptance and self-love. We need to remind girls of their inherent worth, which is not external.